today's session. Um, thank you very much for joining us. If you have not shared your con name and contact information into the chat, please take a minute to do that. Um, we are recording this session. You can always go back and watch it on Canvas, um, on our website. But if you don't wish to be recorded, please disconnect. We use these for training purposes, as well as for um, people that have missed and want to go back and watch those. If you take a minute, please um, take a minute and rename your profile. Put your name and contact or where you work. Um, or your discipline. It helps us understand who is on the call as well as um, just builds that community of practice so that we can hear about Nancy's amazing uh, hair color that she's doing um, in the next little while. So we do talk about some pretty uh, sensitive topics on these calls. So just take a minute and remember to de-identify de any information. Don't share their names, where they live, um, team members who, who we could identify that with. Um, participation is always encouraged. We really want this to be an interactive community so that we know who to reach out to, so that I can know that Kelly Kohler shared some information about Head Start and I know to reach out to her for that, or that Tressa shared something. So just having that interactive um, conversation. And if you have questions, put them into chat or raise your hand, um, unmute yourself. Another way to get some great information are those case narratives. So we have a fantastic one today that Pat's going to be sharing with us. If you have a case that you want to have some information on, um, please reach out to us and uh, consider doing a case presentation. Every time I move, my uh, cursor moves, so I can't forward my screen. The key components of an echo are, of course, our community of practice. We do have a didactic speaker, and then we do our case presentations. Sometimes we do breakout groups. Um, today, we are going to stay in our large breakout group to hear this information. Again, if you are interested in doing a case study and getting some resources, please reach out to Tressa Johnston or Project Scope at USU. Um, we'd be glad to get that set up for you. If um, to get the certificate of attendance, please make sure that you fill out those surveys. The surveys at the end that are sent out are, are what we take that information and are able to keep these free um, and ongoing. So remember to fill out those surveys. A huge thank you to everybody who has filled those out. If you have not filled those out or you're struggling to get those, please reach out to Project Scope or Kurt. Um, and just remember, you will get one today at the end of the session and then reminders up until the next session. Uh, we send out Canvas invites and those surveys. Check your spam if you have not gotten those. Um, and then also just make sure to follow us on um, social media to be able to share that information. Um, we share, Bailey shares some great resources, um, some information that we learn from past sessions, current sessions. And then just a reminder, we are taking the month of July off. So our next session will be August 10th. Um, today, I'm really excited to turn the time over to Pat Boyle, who is going to be talking to us um, about sensory concerns and information and trauma from the NICU perspective. So I'm going to stop sharing and let Pat take it away. Well, we did a dry run and it failed. Oh, it's not. Oh, it is not going to fail. Wow. Can you see it? Yes. And then I just do oh, I practice this. Where is it? slideshow where is oh, it your top button right there oh there we go okay 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 got it I did practice it okay we're ready to go um so I'm Pat Boyle and I'm a physical therapist and I am on the downslide of working like really sliding fast but 
I still have toes in with early intervention and the NICUs um, here in um, Salt Lake City. So I have no disclo disclosures. So what are the objectives for today? Um, I really want to look at the unique, unique assault that prenatal exposure to opioids has on our developing fetus and our infant sensory system. And I want to explore the senses that are, are overwhelmed, which include our hearing, vision, taste, smell, vestibular, proprioceptive, and touch. And touch is just not, I'm touching you. It's, it's a multitude of nervous um, processing um, from light touch to pain. Um, I want you to define how the infant communicates when their sensory system is overwhelmed by being under-responsive, over-responsive, or craving sensory input. And finally, define how being overwhelmed in an environment that has excessive, excessive sensory input can cause developmental delay. So just sort of a quick recap, you sure don't need to hear it from me, I'm not a pharmacist, but these are the meds that, um, our uh, families expose their babies to. Um, now we all know it. We need to get a pharmacist <laughs> on, uh, involved here. Um, so what are the effects? So we have receptors and they're concentrated in the central nervous system and the gastrointestinal system. Uh, the half-life of the opioid is significant because it involves timing of withdrawal. If you have a full-term baby going into a regular nursery to give birth with our new, um, and I literally consult in those nurseries here in Heber and in Park City, where else have I gone? Um, LDS on the newborn. That being said, there's a real eagerness to get those kids eating and out. And some sometimes it's 48 hours. Well, it is, it's 48 hours and you're gone unless the baby declares themselves otherwise. So there you have heroin, which is in 24 hours, but methadone can take up to 20, 72 hours. So the infant can continue to withdraw, withdraw over the six, next six months. And polydrug use is again, one of the things that really confounds all of us, especially since sometimes we don't even know. I, I've never heard of salts, salts are, I don't know if anybody's heard of salts, but I don't even know what those are, but it's a, it's a continuously evolving process of these little kiddos being exposed to what the medical community has to then figure out. Um, so what are the effects? Um, obviously you have your CNS responses, which include excessive irritability. You've got a high pitched cry, um, hyperactive reflexes, you get tachypnea, tachycardia, which is rapid heart and respiratory rates. You get hypertension, which can be very dangerous on the developing brain, um, associated with brain assault um, when we're hypertensive. You get sneezing, yawning, sleep disorders, sweating, hyperthermia, unregulated eating, and it's, it's that baby just doesn't know when they're full, doesn't know when they're hungry. They either eat too much or too little. Um, you get hypertonia, tremors, seizures, and ultimately death. And today I'm with the case presentation sort of squeezed in between seizures and death is profound um, disability as a result of prenatal exposure and the sequela that, that, that happened after. Um, your GI responses include excessive weight loss, diarrhea, vomiting, poor motility, and skin excoriation. And the skin excoriation is from the rubbing that they do with the excessive hypertonicity, as well as their little bums with the diarrhea get excoriated. Um, infants who are withdrawing are unable to interact with their environment, depending on the severity of their withdrawal. So what's normal, typical development? It involves these systems, which include being physiologically stable. So my heart rate, my respiratory rate, everything's within normal parameters. Motoric stability means that I'm, I have smooth rhythmic movements of my body. 
state regulation is I wake up nicely, I transition slowly, slowly, slowly into that awake state, slowly, slowly saying, oh, I might be hungry. Mom, dad, is anybody noticing? I'm mouthing to full on crying. Um, attention and interaction is being able to look at your caregivers, being able to comprehend the environment that is around you. And finally, self-regulation, which is combining all of this together to make one nice little full-term baby. <clears throat> so your opioid exposure, an infant who is exhibiting signs of withdrawal, is unable to attend or interact or regulate their physiology, their motor, or their state systems. They need help in all areas of their development, and most specifically their system. Their sensory system is raw. Um, they're overstimulated, and they need to be protected. So this was a talk that I heard a year ago. <laughs> I've been doing this for a year now. Um, and this doctor um, was out of Cincinnati's Children uh, Center, and he was looking at the ways to score these kids. And the typical scoring from way back when, I remember it, was the Finnegan, which was a labor of love. And then there's a simplified Finnegan, which has eight items that need scoring. And then finally, there's the eat, sleep, and console, which is three items. Um, they have to eat a certain amount, they have to sleep a certain length of time and they have to be consoled within about 10 minutes. So um, these are much easier to score. So uh, if you're going to be scored with the Finnegan, it means you need to be admitted to the NICU or a nursery. Scoring is every three hours. And then there's a specific scoring system that helps with titration to help of meds to help with withdrawal. And that is the approach that is still being used in most NICUs across the United States. Whereas this eat, sleep, and console requires the parent to room in, and it focuses on the parent and the baby dyad. Um, it supports breastfeeding. It supports skin to skin. It supports good environmental control. And the child may need some pharmacological support, especially if they're not consuming the amount of food that they need to, to consume and they're not getting good quality sleep. Um, it has simple parameters. It was implemented in 11 of these Ohio State hospitals and um, the withdrawal was accomplished. Um, there, if So this is a caveat. If there was 100% parental involvement, Overall, there were eight fewer days of opioid treatment and a remarkable nine day shorter stay. And I don't know if you know what the cost of staying in a NICU for a day, it's a significant saving. Um, so moms on the methadone program were allowed to breastfeed. <clears throat> so this is what our um, American Academy of Pediatrics came out with. It says across the country, Pregnant women look lack access to evidence-based theories, including medication for opioid use disorder and infants with opioid exposure fre frequently receive variable care. We know, so we, in early intervention, we know that our family-centered developmental care has really helped in our NICUs. And it's our focus in EI and children and families have survived and thrived with this approach over the last 40 years. So it's, I think it's fundamental that we bring this approach to our children and families of the opioid epidemic. epidemic. Um, it, it's, it's time. I think uh, uh, the, the whole piece of this last year, listening to all of the programs that have been presented with um, this, this Zoom group, this uh, Project Scope, is how variable our moms, especially, are with accessing uh, consistent, reliable care. And I think it wasn't it at one um, presentation, they said at nine months of age, the baby's nine months of age, a lot of the women had services dropped because oh, you're on your way. Um, this is a lifelong struggle for so many families. Um, so what's affected? 
as I mentioned before, um, all of our senses are affected. Our vision is overwhelmed with light and visual input. Um, this is a system that's not ready to use until birth. And so it tends to be very hypo responsive in that these kiddos just don't give eye contact. They don't scan their environment and they're overwhelmed by the amount of light that is suddenly in their, in their environment. Hearing is overwhelmed um, with the variety of noise. And that's the thing about a home is in a home, there's consistency and reliability, uh, whereas in a NICU, there isn't. So starting at 23 weeks of gestation, these kiddos can hear, they're starting to process noise. So they tend to be very hyper-responsive to environmental noise. Smell and taste is something we don't think about often, but if you've ever smelled a hospital blanket, they stink. Um, the towels that come up from the laundry that we're bathing, wrapping these kids in stink. And that is an overwhelming sense. Um, multiple caregivers, everybody wears a different kind of perfume or deodorant or face cream or whatever. And that is overwhelming to these little guys. Um, so it's a sensory input that's quite mature, starting to mature at 16 weeks of gestation. So it is a very, very intact, hyperactive um, sensory system. Movement or our vestibular system, we have our hyperactive responses in these little guys. Um, it's mature at 30 weeks of gestation, but these kiddos are unable to anticipate movement and they're unable to uh, predict when movement is gonna happen. And then once it happens, they don't know what to do with it except to be all out overwhelmed motorically. Um, touch again, there's multiple aspects to touch. Um, we have cold hands, we have light flaky touch when we're stroking and looking for IV access or trying to put an NG tube in. Diaper changes, everybody changes the diaper differently. Um, clothing change after they vomit. And then the pain associated with all of this. And patting and rubbing of your baby is a no-no. Um, finally, proprioception. And that's what they crave. They crave that contained environment of the uterus. They crave being tucked and flexed and pulled into away from gravity. So this is something that they're obviously craving. So when an infant is withdrawing from opioid exposures, all areas of development are affected. So the motor system, they don't demonstrate smooth rhythmical movements of arms and legs. Their head and trunk control are limited by increased tone and, tre and tremors. They're unable to bat at overhead toys, bring hands to mouth, or engage in self-soothing with their hands and bodies. And obviously the batting overhead, they're not gonna develop that if they're too tight. So language and vision, which includes vision and hearing, um, the infants are unable to participate in smooth visual pursuits. And, and if you're a pit person with the school for the blind, you know how important this stuff is. That just being able to scan your environment and be aware of your environment. You may not be giving eye contact, but a lot of these oversensitive kids are definitely looking around and they can't because they're so consumed with, with being with, uh, exposed. Um, so obviously eye contact and attending to parents and caregivers and participating in visual and vocal play. I mean, all of this is just part of being a typically developing child. Cognition. Um, cognition is layered with being anticipating what's going to happen to you. So anticipating that you're gonna get a bottle, anticipating that you're gonna get picked up. And all of that's tuned into your visual and auditory attention. And it's definitely impacted. These kids don't know where they're coming from. So their cognition, their, their ability to figure out their environment is, is very, very impacted. Adaptive, um, they have poor self-regulation around hunger and satiation. Um, sleep is disrupted. Um, so smooth coordinated sucking that is in response to a tummy that's filling is dysregulated. These kiddos continue with their prolonged 
um, unregulated sucking response, even though their stomachs are being filled, which then turns around and makes them vomit because they're overfed, misread cues because everybody thinks they're hungry and they're not. And then social self-regulation is these kids can only self-regulate when they're held tightly and swaddled. Light, lights are dim, um, removed from your world. And so they're not able to explore and approach and show that they're interested in engaging. So social development is definitely impacted. So given the impact initially, many of these kiddos continue to demonstrate developmental issues as life goes on. Um, so what do we do? What's our goal in the nursery and or the NICU is to have no bright overhead lights. I think uh, 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 fluorescent lighting is not good for our visual development. Um, we want diffused light, light and we want dark light for sleep, which doesn't mean that we don't bring in the day night sort of approach to life, which is very important for so many of our harm. So for a lot of our hormones to um, be regulated, but again, it's based on the child's ability to accept. And then skin to skin is huge. Hearing, we want quiet, soft voices. We want humming, shushing, and then quiet for sleep and skin to skin. With, with smell and taste, we want the same person, we want the same smells. We don't wanna be messing around with different kinds of formulas because some of our easy to digest formulas taste terrible. And breast milk obviously is what we want. So we want breastfeeding and skin to skin. With our movement system, we want slow, predictable movements, rocking side to side, deep pressure with movements and combine the deep pressure with predictable movement. So one of the things I wanted to point out was when we hold our babies and we are rocking them, we are sometimes going through about 45 degrees of movement. So their heads are going this way, which is overstimulating the vestibular system, which is in the inner ear. And so long ago, we knew with preemies that we wanted no rocking. So if you're going to move the child, we want side to side. So we want them to go through the same plane of movement and not different planes of movement. So that is the one thing we have the hardest time teaching parents because they're used to, you know, to calm a baby down, which is only just dysregulating them even more. So we really want to tune into what kind of vestibular input we give our kiddos. And then tactile, we want the cares to be predictable. We want um, diaper and dressing. So sometimes uh, keep them in a flex position, keep them on their sides. We want warm hands. Um, we don't want any stroking. And when our massage strokes are being done, we need to do them not with cream, but with oil because it, it provides a smooth, consistent stroke whereas the creams get absorbed and then you get inconsistent tactile input with massage. And again, your STNS, your skin to skin. And so your proprioceptive input, your, 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 your deep containment is definitely where you're gonna get success and skin to skin. So the kiddos are going home. Um, we want them in early intervention, follow up in the community, and many of them actually, because of the new um, movement assessment that's being done in our NICUs, they're being referred to UDAC um, because they are showing uh, inappropriate motor repertoires, um, which you would expect if you've, you are having a difficult time with movement. Um, so I think we have success Obviously, it's been studied if we can focus on the routine in the home um, and support that family within the context of those routines. So you do your home visit, you see the baby, and mom is saying every hour I am feeding this child. And then every two hours they're vomiting. Well, 
let's look at that routine of feeding and are they truly hungry or do they just have a voracious need to suck or do they, you just need to wear your baby, you know, until they can become a little more adept at communicating with you what they want. So talking about, you know, bundling and, and wearing your baby um, so they can receive a lot more support than they do if you just put them down on a hard, cold surface, which is what a bed is. Um, recent, uh, okay, recent discharge teaching. Okay, so the infants have to be, are ready to go home when they are off all medic medical support for 48 hours, but it doesn't mean that they're still not withdrawing. They are still impacted by what has happened. Um, so my sensory rules are the same rules I have for children who are preterm, and they are um, that your proprioceptive, which is your containment, your movement, which is your vestibular, and your tactile input can be powerful communication tools. And when used in conjunction with activities of daily living, they can provide the connection, the foundation, the building blocks to effective communication with the fragile infant. And the other four sensory subsystems must be used cautiously, which is your vision, hearing, smell, and taste. Um, when initially trying to interpret the likes and dislikes, I always say, don't use more than two sensory modalities at any time. So you don't want to be uh, feeding the child while you're singing and trying to engage in eye contact and doing some bouncing. That's way too much uh, stimulation. And again, we've talked about the rocking. Um, trying to engage eye contact can be a very, um, it can be defensive. And I often see, I can see that, that people get worried because the kiddos won't look at them, but they can't look at you if they're overstimulated. Um, and a lot of that is education. Um, and again, if you do some deep tucking, it can bring the kid back to baseline. So uh, move in only one direction. So here's the vestibular input. Um, watch out for visual and auditory ov overload. I hate multi-sensory toys that scream at you and blare lights at you. I don't think any child needs to be exposed to that. Never mind our children with sensory issues. And again, when you're feeding, evaluate how many other sensory systems are being stimulated and stop wearing perfume. You'll help me with my allergies and you'll help that baby figure out their world. Um, so, so I like the weight rule and the weight rule is hard for all of us. So we provide some input and we go, okay, come on. You got to like this, right? And no, they don't. They have to wait. They have to wait. They have to wait and support your parent in the weight strategy. And my best analogy is I slap you across the face, me. I'm slapping you an adult across the face. You slap me across the face because you immediately process that I've just done that. Whereas if I do an intervention with a child who has sensory input issues, sensory processing issues, I can do something to that child and the response is not immediate. The response can take, my analogy is they got to run a mile and run back and boom, they suddenly get it. Um, I had a little one who I knew could do some fine motor activities. I knew she could put this particular object into a particular container. I showed it to her and she looked and looked and looked and looked and looked. And it was probably a good 60 seconds before she then did what I did. It was processing. And if you are living in a busy family with an overwhelming family, those kinds of subtleties can be missed and the kid can shut down pretty quickly. So I finally do hand over hand facilitation with families. So if I'm showing them how to turn a baby from their back onto their side, I have their hands on the baby and then my hands are on their hands because they're going to feel the cadence and the pressure. It's the same with massage. I will massage a parent's arm and say, this is the, 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 this is the slowness of the stroke. This is the pressure of the stroke and they get it. So all of that um, experiential learning is very, very important. Um, so 
The connection for communication is consistency, repetition. When the child's world is consistent and predictable, they trust. That trust builds a bridge to consistent, connected communication. So we've got skin to skin. We've got a massage. You're going to see beautiful swaddle bathing in a minute. Um, just because it's beautiful, not because what I did was beautiful, but it, it was beautiful. Um, I've had families change their babies on their stomach because being supine drives them nuts. And so I, it, it's counterintuitive, but you can actually clean that bum a lot easier when they're in prone or on their bellies than you can. And you can just figure out the ties from the diaper, but anything at all that allows that baby to trust in you. And the final one is how we transition kids into and out of the crib, car seat, um, high chair, couch, whatever. Um, if you have a kid here and you pick them up here like this, you are, gravity's pulling on them. Their vestibular system is being overwhelmed. Their visual system, everything's being overwhelmed. So I always like to turn the baby over to their side get everything tucked and pull them up, flexed and on their side, either to be picked up onto my chest, to be put down into a car seat, put down into the crib, and then you turn them over onto their back. So all of these little movement cues can support the kiddo in their withdrawals. So here's my a uh, video of this little one. Uh, the baby was prenatally exposed to methadone and prior to initiation of daily hydrotherapy, the infant had increased tone, decreased extremity movements, and the transitions into an awake state were not smooth. Unless bundled, the infant cried and was metorically frantic. Sucking was excessive and always interfered with the quiet, calm state. So, Kurt, are you ready? I have been waiting all day for this. <laughs> the miracle therapy right here. It is miracle. It is miracle. And I will share. I don't know if I shared this the last time, but I had a mom who I had worked with her baby, like, I don't know, four or five years prior. She was being rushed into the delivery room and she saw me and she made them stop and say, you showed me how to swaddle bath my baby. I've done it ever since. And it's just like, it's a miracle. All right. So here's this little man. And you can actually point out the sensory things if you want to, or I can point them out but he is not part of this world right now. He's frantic. And if you notice his legs, I mean, smooth kicking is, smooth kicking of a newborn is this, it comes from the hip. His movement is coming from his pelvis because he is so tight. And he, yeah, I have it. So I'm just showing how difficult it is to move him. Um, and he is frantic. He's out of control. He wants to suck. That's all he wants to do. So we get him wrapped up for a bit on his side. And so tell me how ready he is to engage. He just says, leave me alone. Let me suck. Oop. But he doesn't have the strength to suck. So we're getting his bath water ready and the camera person is helping with the containment. So you'll see, um, I'm coming in. I like to not, I like to swaddle them up against my chest because I think I can get a better boundary with the blanket than if you swaddle them in this position. Yeah, he says, I just don't like this. So again, trying to, keep him so he's not, I mean, they lose calories by doing this. These kiddos don't gain weight because their franticness is burning a lot of calories as well as that increased tone. So get him tucked, get him up. And he says, why, why, why Pat? Why are you, just leave me alone. So this is the small bat. Get him down and in, and he says, "Ooh, something good is going to happen. Something good is." And this is the weight stuff. Okay, so the task 
parents look at the task, other caregivers look at the task and say, I want to bathe this kid. And so they pull out the soap, they pull out all the stuff immediately, but they don't wait. And you have with a swaddled cloth in water temperature that's about 101 degrees, you've got 10 minutes and you can do a lot in 10 minutes. So he transitions and he says, oh, you guys are smart. You know what I want to have happen. So I'm looking, this is a wonderful opportunity to give those joints good range because that's something he cannot get on his own. Um, with the kind of kicking that he's doing, he's too flexed. His little lower spine is too flexed. So he's just not getting the nice rhythmic movements that a full-term newborn can have. But he just says, oh, this is wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. So now he's processing. You know, he can scan his environment. And the audio is me just talking very gently to him and very calmly to him. And he's listening and he's processing. And this is what these kiddos miss if all they're doing is tuned into their need to suck and their need to, to be tight, tightly bundled. So he says, this has some potential pad. So again, we look at his arms. He's not upset with this activity. He's very, very calm. Um, and I wanna get to this next video. How much we have until what time? So you have until 12.50 to finish your presentation and then the case study. So hey, I'm on task here. Yeah. All right. All right. And if you have any questions, throw them into the, uh, the chat about this specific procedure. I use fleece. And the reason I use fleece is that it's a um, plastic product. It's made from plastic. So it absorbs the water, it stays warm, and it gets super heavy. If you've ever hiked in the rain in a fleece jacket, you know how heavy it can get. Um, so it, it really does, it, 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 it supports the temperature and it supports the proprioception and that contained touch. So, you know, he's, he's hungry right now because we do this prior to cares. Um, we do this prior to feeding, but I, he's got his hands up to his face and he's using cues appropriately. So he, start, he, he does look good every time I, I to go smile at you, Pat. <laughs> so this is what he needs. This is what the caregiver needs. The caregiver needs to see their child calm and showing appropriate. So he's starting to bring his hands to his face. He's not just screaming and asking for a pacifier. So where are we? 50, right? Okay. So we do some more stuff with range of motion. Oh, why can't I? See, it did this to me the last time I tried to adapt it, but oh well. We will go back. Sorry about this. What do you do about this thing, Janelle? <laughs> it's frozen. Is that what it is? Yes. Yeah, when I try to edit it, it always does this. So I can get wow. out of this because I do want to see him eat. So there's nothing you can do. I've learned that a long time ago. All right. Oh, there we go. Sometimes it just has to catch up a minute. All right, we're gonna go back again and see what happens. Um, so I am gonna take it. Okay. <gasps> Sorry, you can tell that I am a, definitely not a techo. All right. Well, it's 40, I got five minutes. We can spend more time on the case study. So I was going to say that I really wanted to um, thank all these people 
But the people I want to thank the most are the families that I've worked with over the last, it was last year, 44 years, and now it's 45 years. So I will escape, which is escape. <laughs> All right, escape that. All right. So I'm going to go to talk. I'm going to talk about this little guy, KD. Are there any questions about this? So far, not in the chat, but um, it does say thank you for sharing. They would love to see more of the video. Of that video. Yeah. I'm frozen. Oh, no, Pat. Look at me. I'm frozen. <laughs> well, just as long as I can. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. So I want to tell you about this little fella. Um, his name is KD, and he was uh, born in 2014, and he was the product of a 35-week gestation. He had been prenatally exposed um, to multiple drugs and alcohol. He was born unintentionally at home um, without any attention, like it was unattended. And uh, the family wrapped him up, brought him to the ER, and literally just left him in the ER. Uh, and he had not had his cord clamped. So he was profoundly physically involved. Um, he happened to meet um, the most wonderful family who decided to foster him. And he was in the NICU for about three months and discharged home to them. This video that I'm going to show you is him at about seven months. Um, but some of the issues or some of the things I want you as providers to think about is how do you validate foster and adoptive families of hard to place infants. And I'm talking about kiddos like this little guy who ended up being profoundly impacted by his birth. Um, how do you validate the strengths of these kiddos and not focus on their deficits? Um, I think we as early interventionists do a really good job, but how does the community uh, validate these little kiddos as being functioning or members of the human race? Um, and then finally, what are your experiences? Because I feel that that through my involvement with Project Scope, we've been ex we've listened to how the majority of these children are impacted, and it's it's typically their sensory system, obviously, as they get older. And how many of you have been involved with kiddos who are profoundly involved? So let's get into Katie. I'll preface this with mom said he hates his bath. He hates it. So how do I, I can't unfreeze, can I? Well, I'm not sure why you're frozen, Pat. I don't know. I don't know, because it said, you let's, could, I could what? Try stop sharing and see if that brings back your video or. No. Try turning off your video, like stop your video and like for five, 10 seconds and then turn it back on. Maybe, I don't know if that'll actually help in any way. There you well, are. Look, it did. Oh, it moves, okay. <laughs> So now I do share screen again, right? Okay. Yeah. And then I do this video over here. So I'm just going to get this video. Can you see it? Not yet. Can you see it? No. Oh, crap. Okay. This is what we had trouble before with was it didn't come up onto my share screen. So share. Now it looks like you're sharing. Yep. And then that. There Do we go. Yep. Okay, we're back. Yay, technology. I beat it. Okay, so this is little KD. And he is profoundly impacted. He's 
got all the diagnoses that are out there. Microcephaly, he doesn't eat by mouth. He has oxygen need. He ultimately ended up needing a tracheostomy um, when he got older, but he hates his bath. That's okay. It's his arms that we want. Do you want to make it full screen? Put him in. On his side. That's not right. So it's not, so he cries for the whole thing. The whole thing. He does not like water. He likes sponge water. Let's just give him a break. Let's just give him some time. There you go. You're fine. You're fine. Yeah. You're fine. Uh, so he's a big boy. Isn't he got a big? Yeah. Sorry. So what I need is a full size So I wanted to get mom out of that picture. Okay, so he cries for the whole thing, typically. The whole thing. This is good. Because I put him in on his side. And then I've rolled him over. Yeah, you got your chunky monkeys. Yes, you do. And we're going to take out one arm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is he is he more submerged in water than he typically would be? Uh, yeah, a little bit. He he's usually well. He usually covers his stomach because that's why I, I like him to be like deep down in the water. Yeah, you know, it's like you're in their own little swimming pool. Yeah, so. We need a bigger test. Yes, we do. I don't know what to think about it. See, I can get more movement between his arms and legs than he can. You can see. Oh, mm -hmm. So, so the health nurse came over today too, mm -hmm. and she was asking questions, and she's like, you know. Big coughing. Big coughing. So you can also just use a cloth to, to do his wiping. So I think he's big. What I like about this is that he's home. Yeah. What do you think? He's a little strange the whole time. Well, so if we had a bigger tub, I think you can stretch out and really do some range of motion. Because he's tight. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would have a cloth. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay, so we need some clean water. Do you want me to just hit it? Do you want me to just um, go like this? Yep. Yeah. Um, or do you want me to jump with that? Do you fill it up? Okay. So what you wash his hair, you wash his hair with the, uh, there's a stuff. Are you parking the tub? <laughs> yeah. He is good, mama. He is good. 
you get that warm enough, you probably could rinse them. That's what we thought. Yeah. What do you do? You comb his hair with, um, or do you just massage it with? I get a, a little comb and put all the curls. He does like his hair for fun. Oh, he's going to sleep. Mm -hmm. So the very last thing you wash <laughs> is his face. Okay. And that clean cloth. And you just use clean water. Oh. I have not washed hair like this. Yet. It's awesome, huh? She has a lot of it. <laughs> That's there, baby. You can put your thing. Yay. This is so much like a better bathroom. How does that feel? Where do you want me to keep cleaning it? Oh, you're good. Let's do it. That's too cold. I know. I was too hot a second ago. Yeah, we're going to have to have a, that, 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 that. a special deal. Oh, that's too hot. I did what I meant. Um, did you do a bath by yourself? Mm -hmm. There, there, there we go. You got to come through. Okay. So if you want to reach this, we're going to start. Oh, no, we don't want that. We're getting filled. What? Wet, wet, wet. Where's your top? Yes, we need a bigger bag. But he's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's going out of the bath. He's coming up, man. I've not watched hair like this yet. No, oh, you should have seen him try to give him a bath in the um, infant unit box. Pretty funny one. Because their bath's smaller than this one. Yeah. And it. He... Okay, so we're going to get out. <laughs> this is not going to be any sun. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, this is a little boy who had, can you hear me? Yeah. This is a little boy who had some significant irritability surrounding daily routine what can anybody sort of give me is this something that you would do with a family um water therapy is huge i mean i i got better range from him than i'd ever had from him he um was in his home environment kids came home from school but that lack of control or or that overwhelming uh, input that a bath gave him allowed him to dampen that down and interact with his family. So are there any comments about this? So Pat, I don't know if you can see in the chat, um, there's somebody who says, I'm wondering mostly about the hypersensitivity to environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, our kids, okay, typically developing children accommodate. They accommodate to the family that they're paired with. 
Uh, so I'll never forget a family just telling me, well, they're just going to have, have to get used to the other 10 kids in the house. And it's like, yes, they do. You, you don't, there's not a whole lot you can do unless you farm out your 10 kids for weeks on end. But when you have a child with sensory dysregulation, the, it's, the onus is on the family to figure out what helps them. And so sometimes listening to a fan, l- listening to white noise, a predictable environment, that's, that's what I'm talking about. So the onus is on the caregiver to figure out what is dysregulating their child from an environmental perspective. We know in the NICU, but in the home, it's, I see a variety of different reactions to just that. And I'm sure you do too. Do they have a room that they, like I've seen families just go into the bedroom to feed the child because the kid can't eat and listen to the environment. So that's sort of what I mean. And then a follow-up question on that is she's also saying, does that sensory dysregulation last until adolescence? if there is no intervention. Yeah, I mean, I how do you, I mean, I'm, I don't work with children who are not, I work with kids that are not neurotypic, your child with, with specific issues. But I think your families can tell you, yeah. I mean, sometimes you look at, at how, how picky, picky our kids get. Um, with foods, how, how they don't like crowds. I mean, all of that stuff feeds into how they become an adult unless we recognize it. So there's a hand up. Tiffany. Tiffany. I was just gonna give an an example from my family. We had our oldest who was born at 30 weeks. Um, He's our biological son. And then we had We've adopted three, but our second little girl, they released her from the hospital two days after she was born, not having done any of the testing or observations they should have. And the attesting to the fact that the silence and the, and the finding a, a little bit of peace for the child, you know, we, with our oldest, he had quiet. You know, we could put him in his room and it's just me at home. He had that peaceful quiet. <coughs> and he seemed to transition better. But the little girl that we had, we already had two kids before her. And so it was so much harder for her to self-regulate, to be able to find that calm, to be able to focus on, you know, just eating or being okay with just laying on the ground and getting used to just wiggling a little bit, you know. And so I just, I agree wholeheartedly that it ha- you have to find a way to help that child transition, but at the same time, you have to give them um, an environment, at least for a part of the day or throughout the day, that helps her stay calm to, you know, combat all that ses- sensory input. Um, another thing is I love the bath. My oldest son, he thrived in those nice, swaddled, warm baths. Um, So I think that's awesome. And then one other thought I had is that question was asked about how how it transitions into, um, you know, the teenage years. Granted, I don't have teenagers yet. My oldest is nine. But those, a lot of those sensory issues maintain. They stay with that child throughout all of it. And I think there's ways, to, you know, I think they can combat those easier because you can teach them ways that work for them. But for example, my oldest, he literally, if his classroom gets too loud, he cannot handle the noise. You know, he'll say to me, if the, even if my kids get too loud, he'll say to me, mom, I can't do it. It's too loud. I need, I need some quiet time. I need my own space, you know. And so I'll find him something to do. And then if it gets really loud, he simply just says, mom, my ears are hurting. And it's a literal hurt. It's an actual pain that he is feeling because it is too loud. Um, and and our, our other girl, the, our other little girl, she, with her sensory issues, she still carries them. She's only five, but they stay with her, you know, and 
And if it's super loud, she won't calm down. She literally doesn't have like, even if she's falling asleep and something wakes her up or something stirs her, she'll eventually just get off the couch and then run around crazy. She can't control that either. So she doesn't have that ability still to be able to calm enough to accept that she's calm and that she can take a nap. You know, her, her emotions are just, it, it's interesting to see how all of this, you know, it's the same. You can you can tie it into everything that you've said. And even though my, my biological son wasn't exposed to drugs, simply the fact that he was born at 30 weeks has almost all of the same situations and, and circumstances as our other little girl. So anyway, I just think all of this is so important to learn and to understand and even for parents to learn it. So I really would hope that all of those that work in um, early intervention or whatnot would try to use some of these in the home. If I hadn't been in the NICU with my son for that whole time, I wouldn't have known how to handle our little girl and all of her sensory needs because I was taught all of that in the NICU. So I just, I would encourage everybody to use this information and really apply it with their parents that they work with. Thank you so much. <laughs> Parent perspective is more important than anything as far as I'm concerned. So thank you. Um, so the one question I did ask was, if you're, and, and I'm just talking about a child with really specific, like really hardcore um, anoxia, hypoxic um, ischemic and, um, encephalopathy at birth, paired with being prenatally exposed. Um, are you less tender with that foster and or adoptive mom than you would be if that was a biological child? I, I think we tend to not take their feelings into the parents' feelings into consideration. And this one, this mom said she was tired of the providers saying how devastated he was, how do they really want to adopt him? You know, that sort of that. And she just felt that her decision, her family's decision, and especially this little boy weren't validated. So I'm just wondering what everybody else's experience is with this. Nope, oh, Nancy. Yeah, um, I've run into a few um, families who are adopting kids that have been drug um, uh, exposed before birth and are hard to handle. And I actually tell these parents, you are, are awesome for doing this. You mm -hmm. are doing a great job with this child. You are, I have, you know, I, I let them know that I am very impressed with their decision. I am supporting them 100% because it doesn't matter if they're adopted or their own kids. These kids have problems. It does, shouldn't matter whether they're biological or not. These kids have issues. These parents are concerned. They have questions and that's our job is to answer those questions and be there for the parent and the child. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Anybody else? I'll add just another comment, if that's okay. Um, we've had early intervention in our home for almost six years with our last three adoptive kids. And um, I will tell you that you're absolutely right in that we need that extra verbal support that understanding that this is hard, but that we're not, we're not to blame. Because of our lack of understanding, we don't need to feel bad or we don't need to feel stressed, but we are doing okay, that we have been trying our best, that, that there is support out there. It's huge, it's huge. The, the ladies that we have worked with in early intervention have been have been amazing in that you know they're constantly talking about how you're doing so great and you're such a good mom and 
you know, and, and I think that's a huge part of maintaining sanity. Even if it's even like she said, even if it's your biological or if it's a foster kid or you've adopted, it's insanity, you know, and, and we have to be willing to, you know, continue going and verbal, verbal, I don't know, keeping positive and, and letting the parent know that they're doing great is huge in that process. Yep. Yep. I agree. <laughs> Start with the positives and the strengths is, is I think the best mantra we can always have. Okay. Any other questions? I mean, is this something that you feel you can incorporate into your practice? Kurt. Well, it obviously wouldn't be as good as when Pat does it. <laughs> but I mean, it, it is it is really interesting. This is the second time I've watched she um, show this. It's just, it's so interesting how the child's so disorganized and so up in arms and you get him in that warm water with that touch. And I don't know, uh, could we incorporate it? Yeah, it would, it would take some uh, trial and error for sure. But again, the trial and error is kind of how we learn. So I, I think it's a great strategy. I think it's, like I say, I think it's miraculous. You can get these kids that just, are so disorganized and just bring them down to that level where they're willing to be able to work. I mean, I, I don't use the, the bathing technique, but I often try different sensory things to try to get at the beginning and the parents are going, okay, what are you doing? I'm trying to get them organized enough that I can do something with them. And I think that's the key. I think sometimes we jump in and say, okay, we got 30 minutes with this kid. Let's just go. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you spend that first 10 or 15 minutes, get them organized. You get more out of that second 15 minutes or half hour than you would if you just, started at the get-go and try to do stuff because like you say once they're organized century wise then you can stretch them and then you can move them and you can facilitate movement patterns and that that otherwise they're just fighting you on so i i mean i think it's a great as i say a great tool in the tool bag to be able to do this you know to look at at that the uh the technique you use or just you know sensory in general to try to bring them into a place where they're where they're organized enough to work i think it's great i think it's fabulous Oh, good, good. Well, you know, I've, I've trained a lot of nurses in developmental care and nurses are very task oriented. They're very, very focused on every three hours. We need to get all these vitals. We need to do all this stuff and feed them. And I think that's hard to, to, to get a, a very busy nurse on board, but they do because they see the miraculous effects of just waiting you know, let, let's, let's not make this a task. Let's make this, this is a relationship. This is part of the process we are using to get involved, to get to know our little ones. And the biggest thing is if you can get parents on board with this, then you're right, Kurt, you spend 10 minutes prep, and then you get much better, much better help. Okay. I have a question for you is as you're doing that or it later on in your visit, did you have the mom come over and do some of the things um, that you were doing so that she could gain some comfortable feelings within doing that? Not within the context of the video. I didn't want her in the video because of, you know, I was going to use it for a teaching. No, I totally understand that. I was just what I wanted from the mom was her to, cause she, I don't, I cut that out, but she said he screams bloody murder throughout his bath. I cannot, he likes his hair washed a little bit, but he, as soon as we put him in the tub, he starts screaming. So I, I don't know if you noticed, I got him in the tub, he's still crying. And then I'm talking to him and it's wait, wait, wait. And then who he calms down. And I said to her, do you see any difference? And she said, no, 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 he's still the same, you know? And I said, come on, do you see a difference? <laughs> and she was so focused on this isn't gonna work. This isn't going to result in any, have any great benefits because she truly, she brought this little guy, he was seven months. She brought him home um, four, seven, eight, nine, ten, four months previous to that. And she was trying to figure out, you know, what his medical needs were, whatever. And so she was bathing, got a bathe, done. So we went from a task to a relationship 
to her realizing, yeah, he's never done so bad, so well. So she did ultimately get a bigger tub. You know, we got a bigger tub. We I left the sling there, left the cloth there. And he ended up having, he ended up being a really sweet little baby who unfortunately passed away when he was five, but sweet, sweet, sweet. Mm. So mom got engaged, very engaged. Hi, Natalie. Hey, I, uh, as you're talking about this, Pat, um, I sit on a committee that we get together and discuss children that are really, really struggling. And I feel like as infants, I have lots of experience in EI and birth to three. And I think we're so much better at recognizing the overstimulated child that, you know, can't, can't organize enough. But I think we forget sometimes the 10 and 11 year old child who, who was exposed to drugs in utero, and now they're in trouble because their family's afraid of them. And, and as I sit in these meetings with people who are talking about very complicated things, sometimes I'm not brave. And, and I think I'm speaking this out loud because I feel like we got to go back to the basics and we, we need to recognize that the reasons why that child's not able to organize isn't because he hates his whole family or, or that, you know, he, he's determined to beat the system or whatever he or she. So I thank you for this. And I've got, I'm challenging myself to remember that about even the older child, because I think it's easier, Pat, when you can pick them up and put them in a warm blanket in a tub. That's not easy. What you did was really hard, by the way, because you're freaking awesome. But um, <laughs> we have to remember that this continues on in these little kids. They still have these problems. And I yeah. think that was definitely one of those questions, answers to that question. So thank you for bringing that up, Natalie, is that the older kids, we have to go back and think about regulation issues and, and how do we get them regulated? Maybe not a warm bath, but what are some of the strategies that we can do with older kids? And that then brings up that comment that was put in here. And I know you told me your name, but it's a different one, Elisa. Ilsa. Ilsa, see, I was like, I know it's, I'm not going to say it right. So thank you. Um, where she's saying um, she works at Help Me Grow. We get parents who have adopted children that were opioid exposed and now they're beyond the EI age. Um, they recommend some at home cal calming techniques, but she's wondering if there's any other resources that you would recommend. Oh, wow. I don't work with older children. Um, I, I did. I used to a long, long time ago, which is why I kept going younger and younger, because it's like we need to impact those younger babies so that they don't turn out to be the 11, 12 and whatever. Uh, and that was purely from just cyst uh, uh, cerebral palsy. I mean, decreased tightness, decreased, you know, sort of joint stuff, starting early movement, better, better movement. But no, you know, I don't. Um, I do know there are some sensory programs run by OTs, aren't there, that are older? Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of resources out there um, for older kids. There's also a great book that we had an OT that would all, always recommend, and it's Raising a Sensory Smart Child um, that has some activities. It goes up for older kids. Um, as well. I was just trying to Google it and put that in um, the chat for everybody on that. And, one. and Kurt, you can help me out here. You know, sometimes I would have to call my friend Amy Henningsen for some ideas, but I think if you go back to like maybe an original, if there was ever a sensory profile done on the child, going back and reminding yourself, like, what were the things that that overstimulate? What, what do they need more input for? What do they need less input for? And then thinking about our, the daily activities and the things that we're asking the child to do, because each child is very unique. Um, but so going back to some, and, and that's what happens in these meetings, we forget about the evaluations that were done maybe a year or two ago and looking at those, like what really are, because when you, when you say a child is, you know, has a hard time organizing, there's a, a ton of reasons why too much, too little, and it varies from child to child. So I don't know, Kurt, I'm, I'm talking too no, much, I was, but. I was just gonna say, I know one of the things that Amy used to say is she'd have the parents keep a list of when the kids was set off and what immediately preceded that. 
because until we figure out what sets them off, you know, treatments are just mm-hmm. kind of random. And so she would say, okay, I want you for this three day period because parents are already overwhelmed as it is. But for this three day period, I want you as best as you can just nowadays punch it in your phone back then is write it on paper. But what happened immediately preceding the child melting down. And then that way they could figure out kind of what that initiating factor was and then could develop some treatment or some strategies around diminishing that. But I think you make a good point, Natalie, we go in and if we're not paying attention to what the triggers are, so to speak, for that sensory overload, um, we go in and we, we can create worse situations than we're helping. So I think that that kind of that diary method is really one of the, the keys early on and then figuring out, okay, now that's what worked. That's what caused the increase. Now this is what causes them to calm and we can kind of figure out what kind of treatment strategies we have. So. I was going to mention for on top of that, one of the things that I've tried really hard with my oldest because he's more, um, he understands it a little bit better, but as long as I am completely open with him, I'm open with him about how difficult it was when he was born. I'm open with him about some of this difficulties that he might have. He, because of that, he will come to me and he will talk to me about what he's doing what's happening to him he will ask me questions and and from those conversations I can then pinpoint and I can say okay so he's brought up my ears hurt four or five times so that's something that we need to combat you know or he's brought up the fact that you know he can't whatever I don't know I don't have another example but he can't do something else or something else is really hard for him as long as I can maintain an open conversation with him about what's happening to his body, then he will maintain that open conversation with me about difficulties or concerns. I think that in and of itself is crucial, especially as they get older, is to just keep talking, you know, and and letting them know what they've experienced because if they know they have the tools then that they need and they can find the information for themselves and, and discuss it with me after that. So open communication and being completely honest is... I think is crucial. Tiffany, I love that. Thank you. Um, that's also a really great reminder of how we can teach these older kids to recognize themselves. Thank you. That was excellent. I I have a lot of things I've learned today. So it's been a great meeting. Emrys, you come on mute. Tamara Baird, do you have a question or comment? Okay, maybe she has not been so I'm going to mute her. And then, Pat, there is a question. If um, somebody can get in contact with you, either by email or phone, and if that's okay, if you'll drop your email into chat or come on mute and just tell us. Okay, yeah, I can uh, send you my email. Um, let me just see. I, I put it in initially when I registered for chat. Okay. Is so that... you could scroll up there. There it is. I just found it. Nope. Now you've stopped sharing your screen. Oh, st- stop it. I was th- I thought that was my problem was sharing the screen. <laughs> it's okay. I'll go back up and look for it. Anybody else have any thoughts or um comments based on what we saw on that video or um, ideas to regulate older kids, great resources. I feel like I'm talking too much, but one of the things that we were able to do with our oldest is um, we noticed some of the difficulties that he was having physically. So he would trip and fall all the time. Um, Kicking a ball was really hard for him. So we did put him in occupational therapy, but the group that we put him in, you know, they worked on three or four different things with him at a time, not just, you know, the physical, but they would talk to him about, you know, his eating sensory issues. And, And I think that that's a good resource to even try to find too. The place we took him to was up in, it was in Draper called Function Abilities. 
And they did a great, great job with helping him learn his own coping mechanisms. You know, so oftentimes if you want a kid to calm down, they'll tell him, hey, if you were to do this, separate yourself from the group, you can, you know, help yourself calm down or whatever. But they would also then say, if you're in a class and you can't leave the class, you know, like breathing things that hold up their hand and they do breathe in and breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And he can do that in class under his desk or whatever and work on calming himself down without having to leave the group, you know? So I think I, I love function abilities. I'm sure there's other places around there that would do that, but I think that's a good resource because they also come up with some of those ideas that I would have never thought of. Yeah, I think that the Utah Parent Center um, or also the autism uh, resource at this state has a list of uh, some occupational therapists throughout our state. You could also encourage 